I don't have any great wisdom, but I, I do enjoy the time of these uh, sort of events where we get a chance to, it's not like I'm going to answer your question from on high. <laughs> I will not look down upon from the mountain and give you my great wisdom. I, I really think it's more of us talking to each other, and I just happen to be the guy with the microphone and the laptop. But does anyone have a comment or question? Anything you'd like to contribute, anything that's going on that you would know we can take 15, 20 minutes and just chat with each other. Just raise your hand high, I'll call on you and speak nice and loud so we can all hear. If we can't hear you, I may repeat the question. Is there anybody? Yes. Well, first, thanks for uh, giving me comfort over the last several years and stuff like that. It's been like atheism, so. It's an honor, thank you. Um, the question is, and if memory calls, when you came out, you wrote a letter Family. Yeah. Would you now in 2018, looking back, would you do that the same way again? Or would you do it differently? For those in the back who may not be able to hear, uh, I sent an email letter to my family and closest friends when I realized I was an atheist and I was, I was wanting to make it a matter of record. And mostly I just, I knew the rumor mill was in full kick and everybody was like, you know, they're praying for, we're going to pray for Seth, pray for Seth, bless his heart. Bless your heart. Do you guys have that saying here in the Bless his heart. Have you seen that poster that says, inside every bless your heart is a teeny tiny fuck you. <laughs> Poor Seth, bless his heart. <coughs> He's been led astray. He's going to the church of atheism. Just another religion. Rather than leave them at the mercy of the rumor mill, I wanted them to hear it from me. I would, I would have uh, written the letter differently today. Back then, I was trying to defend why I left. And so I wrote a very long letter that got into the Bible and the contradictions and the immorality and the execution of children and slavery and the beating of slaves and nonsensical stuff, the evidence against Adam and Eve. And, blah, blah. and I, was trying to, I was trying to win. So I didn't want them to just understand, but I found myself like trying to not necessarily convince them, although I did have this naive belief that, wow, when people hear all the amazing stuff that I have learned, we're, they're going to immediately turn away from their faith. <laughs> and they'll be so curious to know what I have discovered. And we will all have a max, mass exodus from religion and we'll sing Kumbaya as we go toward a more rational world. <laughs> I sent that letter out, dozens of people, one response. I got one, there was a, an alarming lack of curiosity. No, I, I thought people would say, well, that's a smart dude. I wonder what he discovered. We should talk. Let's go have coffee. None of that. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Except for one which said, I see that you've traded in Christianity for the false religion of atheism. That's the only one I got back. Now, I, and I have these conversations when people are coming out to their family. I always tell them, keep it short. And... Don't try to win. You, the purpose of having a conversation with someone about your apostasy is not to convince them that you were right. You just need to make the statement because you're sort of taking ownership of your own life. You need to know that, you know, I've been going through a journey and I've done so much research and study and I've come to a point where I just don't believe this anymore. I'm still the same person. I love you, I love all of you, despite the fact that we may disagree on this. You know, there's no reason to be alarmed, it's okay. I'm, if God shows up tomorrow, I wanna to know that. But, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a seeker of evidence. If God shows up tomorrow, I wanna to know, wouldn't you, right? Uh, and, uh, and then don't let him suck you in which is what normally happens. Well, what about that, 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 And then before you know it, the activist in you starts to come out and you're like, well, if you look, read, read this book right here and you start to, and you're trying to win. And you, people, I, get, I used to get sucked in all the time. I would write a much shorter letter. I would not try to present the evidence. I would make it all wrapped around the word I, not you, which is a word that puts people on the defensive. You're wrong about your faith. You're deceived. I would say, I no longer believe. But you know, I'm happy, and I'm in a good place, and I love you, and I just wanted you to hear it in the horse's mouth. That's the letter I would write today. And then the discussions about the validity of Christianity, those come later. 
Those are other conversations. If you come out to a loved one or a friend or something, if you sit down in a living room or over coffee, for Pete's sake, use the word I, not you, and do not let them suck you in. They will suck you in. Do not let them. Keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it positive. Even if they break down, right? Keep it positive and then get, get out. The longer conversations happen later, okay? Forgive the long answer. I'll try to keep them more brief moving forward, but that's what happened. It's, it's, a, it's a long sort of a deal, you know? Back in the day, I just had this naive belief that, man, all we need is the evidence, but I've learned more and more. People who have a greater desire to believe than they do to know won't listen to your evidence. They won't be convinced by evidence. We have to actually engage them emotionally a little bit more and develop relationships and get over those hurdles before we can ever talk about the data. We're not gonna change the world with data. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, Seth, I wanna thank you for your very unique voice in the skeptic community. Um, you have an approach, I think, that differs a bit. There's a tendency, I think, in the skeptic community to think of religious people as, well, they're idiots. They're, they're morons. Um, how could you think this sort of thing? And uh, something that I learned, I think, from listening to you is that our enemy is not religious people. Our enemy is bad ideas. So I want to thank you profoundly for that kind of approach. I think it's a much more, um, a much more uh, compassionate approach that you take, and that's something that I incredibly appreciate thank you. Uh, in your approach in the skeptical community. Uh, my question for you is, what did your transition look like moving out of, out of video editing into what you do now? Is it something that ultimately didn't come around until the advent of Patreon, or did it happen prior to that point? What, what did that transition look like? How did I become a full-time activist and yeah, be able to yeah, pay the bills doing what, what I do? Because I know you came out of it, you mentioned you came out of video editing. Well, you know, I've got a book coming out, or a book out that I want all of you to buy. <laughs> I did not plant that guy. I did not plant him. <laughs> But you need to go to audible.com and iTunes. Make your check payable to save the Andrews Family Foundation, please. No, no, no. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, it's interesting because I, when I was worried about my job, let me tack this on to the job story because uh, many people are wondering what happened. But to their credit, and this is, a, this is a credit to them, the evangelicals who owned the company that I worked for that served churches when I had the conversation with them that I don't believe in God. Uh, instead of finding an excuse to get rid of me, the owner said, you know, people died for your right to believe or not believe. Uh, in this free country, you have the right to be an atheist and we will support that. We disagree on this, but we will stand by you. It was, it was, uh, it was amazing and it doesn't happen very often. And then they took most of the work that was not church related, but it was like based on universities and colleges and city planning, and they gave those to me, and they just sort of funneled all the other stuff elsewhere out of respect for me and respect for the client. That's rare. <laughs> um, but as I was working, I would go home and I would produce all evening, all night, all weekend. And so over time, as the show and the, the site became more successful, you know, all these little streams begin to feed the ocean, you know, being an author several times over, well, that helps. And the fact that the books are well received, that helps. The podcast became big enough that I was able to get some show sponsors, you know, who weren't afraid of an atheist show who would be on my broadcast. And I turned away a lot of them. And that sucks, folks. The, someone comes to you and they're like, hi, we're company X and we would like to give you our money. But you know that they're either not the kind of organization that your audience will be served by or they're kind of woo-ish, like, like, I can't do this ad. They'll, this is, this'll totally kill my credibility, I can't. Please keep your money, have a nice day. That sucks, <laughs> that sucks when you're self-employed. Uh, so, you know, I'm thankful for the sponsors that I do have and then I make up the difference with my supporters who go to Patreon and all those little rivers sort of feed the stream and I, the company folded in 2015 but I was ready and became a full-time activist in the summer three years ago. And I was scared and excited. And uh, I don't know what the future holds, but I'll continue to produce as long as people continue to benefit and listen and watch and care. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, first uh, question kind of reminded me of people praying for you when you made your transition. And uh, to me, that's, that's the kind of thing that always kind of makes me cringe when I hear people all pray for you. Uh, it's a well-meaning, 
but it's, it's something to me anyway, personally, just kind of makes me grin. My mother is 95 years old, and I'm expecting she won't be around very much longer when the news comes that she's gone. I'm trying to just hear all the prayers coming in. And it's, I don't know how to deal with well-intended sentiments, but things that just make me cringe at the same time. When someone says, I'll pray for you, yeah, it kind of rubs you the wrong way because it feels like a, you guys feel the same? For me, uh, it really depends on the context. If someone doesn't know I'm an atheist or that's just the language in which they speak and you, you feel like their intent is not one, it's not a jab, you know, I'll, I'll pray for you. So, you know, you're, in, you're, you're sick and you know, they say, well, I'll, I'll pray for you. Part of me is like, knock yourself out, no skin off my teeth, right? <laughs> it's when they are looking down from that sort of high mountain of superiority and saying, mm -mm, you poor, poor thing, I'll pray for you, right? I'll pray for you. That's tough. But I don't spend a lot of time on it. I don't spend a lot of time on when I sneeze and someone says, bless you, and I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> Jesus Christ, people, is that what we're reduced to? Or is that what we're reduced to? Is that the hill we want to fight on, really? Because honestly, it's just a reflex. It's a cultural reflex that people do. Let's have a conversation about something else instead of putting them off right at the front end and looking like such an intolerant person. If, what's that line that says, we tend to judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions? Their intentions probably just good. Bless you, you know? If, if, uh, if someone says something or makes a religious statement, uh, you know, if it's not what I consider to be something that's kind of a jab or inappropriate, honestly, I'll try to see the intention behind it. And if it's someone who's just, that's just how they talk because that's all, how what they've always known and they're a victim of bad ideas, and that's not the hill we want to fight on today. I'm like, well, thanks. You know, I, I think we have done uh, sometimes a poor job of choosing our battles. We're so busy trying to get you know, win these tiny little scraps here that we've, we've missed the larger war. And I'm more interested in the theocrats. I'm more interested in the indoctrination of children. I'm more interested in the culture war. And, you know, once we fix those things, all the other stuff, that'll fix itself. You know? uh, there was somebody else. Uh, yes? Um, yeah, I'm building on what you said about you being very compassionate of understanding. When I first left the faith, I was I was livid. Everything religious made me angry, made me lash out at people because basically what fell down for me was I was lied to all my life. People were trying to sell me bullshit. And it just made me so mad. Did you go through uh, to something similar? Uh, her comment was when she left the faith, she was just livid, she was pissed. Yeah. Yep. I, I've been lied to. How many opportunities did I miss? How much good information was I not introduced to? I, yeah, I went through that. In fact, you can see that in the tone of my work early in the uh, first years of the Thinking Atheist. There's a lot more sarcasm. There's a lot more story of Susie type stuff that's kind of jabbing at religion. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a right to be angry about the damage done to, to children. I, I see it as a, if, if you take a young child and you cordon them off from other opportunities and you say, you will think this, and then especially if you're instilling a fear of eternal torment if they ever stray, people carry that stuff with them for the rest of their lives, many end up in therapy. I think it's a form of abuse. I mean, I, you're, you're abusing... Uh, you are robbing a child of what they may become, and you are shackling that child, and potentially the adult, with irrational fears that may affect their, their careers, their happiness, their relationships with their life partners, their children. I, I just think, um, yeah, we have a lot to be angry about. But, you know, I, I, I think anger has its place. If we're always angry, People stop listening. Have you noticed those people who, those agents of recreational outrage on Twitter? Have you seen those people? I mean, it is just nonstop, nonstop. And after a while, it's like the broken car alarm. It's, you know, you're having dinner and the things in the background, dee, 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 and you just stop hearing it. You just stop, you just tuned it out. I think if, if we have a balanced perspective when the legitimate times to get good and outraged come, and those times are many, uh, then it means something because it's not our default. 
What a tragic life it would be if all we did was just yell and scream and shake our fist all the time. Life's too good to miss out on the good stuff. Do not, do not miss out on the good stuff. Love, joy, laughter, human connection, all of the stuff that you know, we should be able to enjoy. And then you live a more balanced perspective. You know, I, I, don't, I get mad at atheists for posting really bad memes about Christians. Uh, I'm married to a Christian, by the way. People say, um, you, uh, what, all religious people are stupid, that's one I saw. Uh, or uh, religion is a mental illness, I've seen that one. That's totally false, religion is an idea. And people who believe in religion, I think in many ways, especially fundamentalists, are victims of bad ideas. I, I don't, I know some beautiful Christians, I know some shitty atheists. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's time for us to start talking about human beings first, and then we can get into the rest of it. But to see someone and say, oh, you're a Republican Democrat. All Trump supporters are racist. I'm sorry. I understand your frustration. But I know Trump supporters who were single issue voter, voters who voted only on choice or uh, on um, anti-choice. They didn't know anything about anything else. They weren't motivated by racism. They, and so that alone, causes the argument to fall apart, but yet we speak in these sort of broad terms. All, like, all generalities are false. Have you heard that clever saying? All generalities are false. It's like them saying all atheists are this. I mean, you get a people like this in a room and you get us to, get us to agree about anything. Star Trek. <laughs> We had the conversation today. Picard, Kirk, Janeway, who's your captain? Picard! Why can't you all just, they can't even agree on captains, people. Human beings first. Well, that sure would be nice. Yes, in the blue. So I had an interesting experience between yesterday and today. Yesterday, uh, my younger brother got married, so he's the last one in the family to get married. We grew up. Just southeast Minnesota, Lake City, Birdwise Water Team, if you know it. And I didn't realize it's the same minister we had when I was a kid. And I hadn't been to church since I was like 18, 19. And uh, I didn't realize just how religious it really was. Thinking back on it, I always kind of thought it was more humanistic. There was a lot of love, there was a lot of peace, there wasn't the hellfire and damnation like other churches I'd been to. So standing up front, listening to this, you know, Jesus Christ in their hearts and all this kind of stuff, and I almost couldn't stand it. I haven't been around it for a long time. And so my question, sort of for you, how do you handle it in the South? <laughs> Tequila. <laughs> Are you guys doing okay? Do I have time to tell a quick story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm at a wedding of a friend, and uh, it's uh, a beautiful ceremony. This was, I think, last year. And uh, they brought in this fundamentalist preacher. And it was the same deal. They were getting married and they went through it, where the, the wedding, which I think needs to be about the couple, instead ended up being about the ideology, right? Instead of being about the people. So this hardcore pastor is going through all of these biblical tenets that the man and woman are supposed to go through. And I'm watching and I'm like, oh God, here we go, right? <laughs> the ring is a symbol. It has no beginning and no end, like the love that Jesus has for us all. Like I'm waiting for all this stuff to come down the bike. You know, and then they have that, uh, they play religious music and whatnot. But he, all of a sudden, he, he was talking about their responsibilities. And he looked right at the woman. And he said, I'm going to use a word with you that not a lot of people in this day and age like to use. Starts with S. It's a word that you were commanded to do. You are to submit. <laughs> now, Natalie's sitting next to me, and she feels me start to come out of my head.
Your husband is the God-appointed head of your household and you will submit to his authority. I am about to walk up there and go, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Natalie's doing this thing. She has this thing where she'll, like on my knees, she's like, 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 like this. Because <laughs> she can read my mind. <laughs> and I, I just thought to myself, what happened to life partnership? And, and this is what Hitch meant when he said that religion poisons everything. And I know that's an extreme statement, but I, I understand why he said it. Because this should be about them, about making decisions together and sharing life together and loving each other and, and all of the stuff that a union of any kind, a life partnership, hell, outside of marriage. And instead, this religious authority, authority comes in and essentially minimizes her and says, you are now, in, in many instances, in many contexts, a servant of this man. You are not his equal. And you must submit to him. And uh, it, I understand your frustration. There's not much we can do about it. We just choose to attend or not attend. It's not our wedding. It's not our family. It's not our party. But I also, in my own life, have decided more and more every day that I'm going to be as anti that as humanly possible, meaning that everybody who goes to that event is going to know how I feel about how life partnerships should be uh, <coughs> framed. And that's going to not be submitting, but it's going to be about respect and boundaries and communication and, and essentially, you know, sharing life together. Let's do one more. Uh, let me grab somebody in the back over here. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. you one more story and then uh, <laughs> that's what happens when you get a broadcaster storyteller to come to Minneapolis. Are you guys having a good time today? Is it being <laughs> I so want you to have a good time. I want you to feel like today's investment if, uh, in your busy schedules was worth it. I want, to, I want you to leave with a smile. Um, true story. I'll try to make it short. I, I don't have a great relationship with my, my family because they operate with a, a, an amount of religious latitude that, that I am not afforded, which speaks to your situation, right? So we get together and everybody's wearing their John 3.16 t-shirts and the kids are off admissions and hey, so-and-so's a deacon to the church, how's that going? Oh, we heard a great sermon the other day, blah, 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 blah. And no one is ever really engaging me. I don't wear my atheist stuff to family. I, that's not why I'm there, all right? That's not the hill I want to die on in that particular day <laughs> and um, but they told me they and I don't do a lot with my family but they said hey your cousin Sue is coming into town from Chicago and I hadn't seen her in 15 years and they're like well, she's gonna be over at your sister's house you ought to come over and say hi and I thought, well that, that'd be nice and so I hopped in the car that night and I drove over and we all sat around the table and it's my mom and my dad and my siblings and some other people. And then there's me and then there's Sue and her husband, Mark. Okay, I didn't know much about her husband. I hadn't seen Sue in a decade and a half. And so she's playing catch up. <laughs> so tell me about you. What, now, what do you do for a living? And so she was asking, well, I do this and I do this. And I'm a deacon at my church just down the road off at 41st Street. And, and we do this. And the kids, you know, they're off. They're involved in youth, you know, whatever. Oh, well, what do you do? Can't even answer the question. Now, I'm over here off the table and I'm, I'm having an oh shit moment. <laughs> shit. Because she's gonna ask me what I do for a living and I've had such a contentious relationship with my mother and father who are going to lose their minds. So they're going around the table, what do you do? Tell me about yourself. What do you do? Tell me about yourself. What do you do? Tell me about yourself. And finally it came around to me. <laughs> and I decided I was going to try to minimize any potential harm. <laughs> tell me, 
what do you do for a living, Seth? And I said, oh, I, uh, I'm a, a video and audio producer and, uh, and uh, broadcaster, and uh, so I do a lot of audio and video work. <laughs> and I sort of handed it off to the next person. Now I could tell she was not satisfied. <laughs> What do you do? Tell me about yourself. Now, Seth, tell me more about what you do. <laughs> well, I, what's your show about? What, what, what kind of broadcast do you do? Well, we, we, ha we, uh, we do a broadcast which deals with religious issues. <laughs> down the table, and I, I knew it was, this was not over, and I thought, this is gonna get ugly. And she finally came back, and she's, the whole table's watching me, and she said, now tell me, what, what kind of religious issues do you talk about? And all of a sudden, lightning hit me, like, I just almost got angry. I thought, everybody else at this table gets to be who they are. Everybody else gets to talk honestly, without apology, about what they think, what their, their philosophies on life are, what their life goals are, what they agree or don't disagree with. Why am I the one who is supposed to sit on my hands to keep everybody else comfortable? And so I looked her in the eye and I said, I host the most popular atheist radio podcast in the world. <laughs> And both of my parents were like, <laughs> it was a liberating moment for me. It was at that moment, honestly, that I stopped, I stopped hedging. I stopped worrying about keeping the peace. Fuck it, life is too short. Why in the world does everybody else get to be as, as open as they want about who they are? And I'm the one playing by a different set of rules that they put in place, no way. And I waited for the conflict, and I waited for the tears, and I waited for just, oh, the, the evening is ruined. And it wasn't. No one freaked out. And the evening came to a close, and we all hugged, and I, and I laughed. Now, there is a point to the story. It was a while back, she went, a few weeks, she went back to Chicago. Sue and Mark went back to Chicago. I hope they don't mind me telling the story. Um, <laughs> And she sent me an email, out of the blue, sent me an email, and she said, so I'm reading your book, and I find your story very interesting. And I'm like, holy shit, she got my book? <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, my husband's been kind of on a journey, and he relates a lot to kind of what you've been talking about. Could I give you his email address so you guys could talk? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, give me his email address. Catholic Church became disgruntled with the corruption and the abuse and the insanity and just the, the poor doctrine, the guilt and the shame. He, he was on a journey in his own life, desperate for somebody to talk to. If I hadn't been true to myself around the table that night, he may have never known that he had someone he could reach out to. And we had weeks of amazing conversations. And I don't know that he's an atheist, but I think quietly he just might be. I don't know. For sure. Okay? It's not possible for everybody. It's a cost-benefit decision for everybody. You're not a coward if you decide to keep quiet, or in this instance, you're not gonna say it, or you don't wanna tell your employer. Don't bear that burden of guilt and shame. That's not on you. I understand there are life consequences that you have to deal with. But whenever possible, don't apologize for being you. You are not on this earth to keep other people comfortable. You are not on this earth to keep everybody else comfortable. Be you at the volume you choose, for the reasons you choose. It is a wonderful, beautiful, and I think necessary thing. Thank you all very much.